I want to come back to the question of out-of-body experiences because, Sam, I know you have been uh, the director of a uh, study called the AWARE study, which is actually trying to, to, to check on this in some scientific way to see if there's a way to prove that the mind is more than just brain function. Do you want to tell us about your study? Uh, not right now. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to actually, before we can do that, I just need to touch back on, it's important for everyone to understand what we're talking about. I, I deal with cardiac arrests every week. Uh, I've resuscitated hundreds, if not more, of patients, and it's my bread and butter. It's what I do for a living. Um, and the important thing which Peter was alluding to uh, is to understand that actually while there are many things that make people become very sick, and their physiology is very different. And that's why I think we're talking about different things. And that's the whole point of we're comparing apples and oranges. I don't think we're all talking about the same thing using the same terms. But with cardiac arrest, it's understood very well because we have to understand the physiology in order to be able to bring people back and preserve their brain. So as Kevin mentioned, when you have, at the beginning, when blood flow to the brain gets beyond a certain threshold, then the brain does not function. Now, when someone's heart stops, immediately, immediately, heart when there is no pumping of the heart, there is no blood, zero blood getting into the brain. And immediately, a patient will develop fixed and dilated pupils. They lose all of their brainstem reflexes, which is why we can put a tube into their airway and they don't gag. And their brain stops functioning completely within seconds. Now, when we do resuscitation, with the best of efforts that we make, we can only get a little bit of blood, 5% of the blood that the person has ordinarily into the brain and that's why throughout the entire period of resuscitation, the brain remains flatlined. And the pupils remain fixed and dilated. The brain stem does not function. The only cases where that may be an exception is if we have transiently restarted the heart and we lose it again. But when the heart doesn't beat, that's the case. Now, interestingly, to go to your question of consciousness, what we have is that we have many thousands, if not millions of people now, who are reporting these incredible experiences from all over the world who, many of whom have described our doctors, our nurses, conversations, what was going on, but you cannot have a functioning cortex in this time. It's not possible. So we're left with a paradox. So this led us to put together a more definitive study, um, which we call AWARE, Awareness During Resuscitation, to try to iron out some of these issues. And part of that was to try to study the quality of oxygen getting into the brain and hopefully improve outcomes for our patients so they don't end up brain damage. And part of it was also to try to study these recollections that people have. Now, um, our study has been analyzed and we will be uh, releasing the results soon. But I can just give a little snippet, if I may, just because everyone asks us. And what we, what we have found, and this is not just my interpretation, these are experts. We have at least 20 experts from neurology to psychiatry to various fields in neuroscience, to emergency medicine, who have conferred the findings. That essentially, uh, our data suggests that these so-called out-of-body experiences, uh, at least when they occur in the cardiac arrest setting, which is why I call them visual awareness, cannot be defined as a hallucination. They cannot be defined as a hallucination. They are not consistent with what we call a hallucination. Furthermore, what we've also managed to demonstrate is that essentially when a person has died, technically the way they're defined dead, um, that what happens to our consciousness is that it disappears from the external view. So a bit like how you go for surgery and you're given a general anesthetic and you may appear that your consciousness is not there, it hasn't disappeared off the face of the earth. It's just not present. And so essentially death is not something to be afraid of. And the final point, which I think is important and it touches on a lot of things that were said, is that actually when you talk to people after the experiences, they're expressing many different memories. Some of the people who are telling you that they had a near-death experience, they're telling you about memories that were occurring a week or two later in the intensive care unit. And so the problem I have with a lot of the studies that my colleagues were quoting here is that you're taking people who had an experience 10 years ago. Who knows really what was going on at that time? So it's very important that going forward, we study Can the experience of people have in cardiac arrest. I'm sorry, I'm fascinated I'm done, by this, actually. but I'm just, I just want to address one aspect because a couple of people have mentioned these recollections, these memories, and one of the things that I find sets a near-death experience apart from any other experience, and I, we've all listened to many. I've listened to probably 500 stories 
And we would all say the exact same thing, which is that I remember my own experience as precisely and accurately today as when it happened. And it's the experience of remembering something in the present tense. It's not recalling a memory mm -hmm. from 10 years ago or 50 years ago. You're saying this is a, there's a different quality it to this kind of memory. It is entirely qualitatively different from any other experience. Dream, hallucination, or big event in your life, it is a qualitatively different type of memory. So it's really not a recollection. And I think that's one of the things that is interesting from a physiologic standpoint, because indeed the brain cells start to disintegrate, start to burst. There's no way those brain cells are forming memories. If you look at the studies that were done trying to replicate the hallucinatory effect of a near-death experience, there are similarities when the neurotransmitters are injected, but the memory, again, is qualitatively different. It is not a near-death experience. I mean, these are not recollections. I remember the day my son was killed very clearly, but I know that if I were to tell that experience of that day <clears throat> every couple of years for the rest of my life, the details would change a little bit. Good but heaven. everyone's description of yeah. a near-death experience remains exactly the same, no matter how much time has passed. I think the memories are extremely vivid. And the reason that they're vividly recalled is because you are activating your memory system because of fight or flight. And one of the best examples, if you ever want to read, is of Dostoevsky when he went through a mock execution. He was in no danger of cardiac arrest or fainting like some of his other fellow prisoners were. But his memory for the experience, which he wrote about later, is, is, is extremely the, much The problem like with that it. is I, in those 500 stories, have only talked to a handful of people who chose to return. And they chose to return for very specific reasons. I have not spoken to a single person who has had a near-death experience who voluntarily said, yeah, I, I want to come back. And so that speaks against the idea that it's this fight or flight, that it's some evolutionarily beneficial process, because nobody wants to come back. Well, uh, no, I don't think that's true. I have a number of people who want to come back. In fact, one of the people I can think of, she uh, has married. She had a child. The child was about six months old. And uh, there was a lot of ironing to be done. And she got all the ironing in the basket. And she uh, had her cardiac arrest. And she had her near-death experience. And she went down the tunnel, met the being of light. And then there was a discussion uh, with uh, her father, who had already died. And she said, I've got to go back, because my husband can't do the ironing. I have to go back. <laughs> and that was the reason that she said. In fact, some of them do have reasons for but, why but they come back. I think it's important, though, I think just to touch on what Mary says. And I think, Mary, you know, that's why I, I strongly uh, look into calling people's experiences such as yours no longer near-death experience. Because as you probably agree, medically, there is no such thing as being near-death. It's a very unscientific term. In my, my way that I would define yours is an actual death experience. And therefore, what I think is often what you know, Kevin may be talking about is actually a different experience. You know, may, basically, if you think about it, Many human experiences have a lot of overlap. It doesn't mean they're the same thing. So I think it's important that going forward, uh, we study people who've objectively gone through a period of cardiac arrest because, one, we understand the physiology. Uh, it's clear. We can study it. We can measure it. And then we can go back and look at human experience. And, and certainly, the, the, the evidence that's coming through at least raises a serious question, which is that, you know, as you were coming to, can human mind and consciousness, even though we've all perceived that it's produced by brain activity, well, the evidence is that that at least has been challenged because we have cases where brain activity cannot be going on, but consciousness and memory appears to be going on. So maybe, for instance, human memory, we should be thinking about the relationship between memory, consciousness, and the brain, perhaps more as like the RAM in a computer. So is the memory coming because of RAM? In other words, you need it for memory to express itself. Or is it that the memory is being formed by the hard drive? You know, so how does it work? And this is, these are all interesting questions that are coming out for us. But I think at least uh, those of us who are actively involved in the field of cardiac arrest, who, who also work with so-called near-death or what I call actual death experiences, uh, we, we consider that um, there's enough to make us want to pursue this question more, that consciousness may continue 
when the brain is not functioning, when we've gone beyond the threshold of death.